This session of Keenan Architecture draw along sessions where we're working with 860 Lakeshore Drive, our second of a modern master, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. We had worked on the Barcelona Pavilion earlier, and now we're going to address his movement into teaching the world how to build skyscrapers. So post-World War II, there's a push for rapid developing American environment, urban space, and created enormous land values in Chicago along Lake Michigan, which then drives real estate prices so high that it benefits people to build vertically to take advantage of the land. So in 1949, Mies van Rohe was given this commission in Streeterville neighborhood of Chicago, Illinois, adjacent to Lake Michigan. Streeterville is the land that was pushed out from the Great Fire in 1871 to create more space for development north of the river, north and south of the river. So we've got twin towers here, 860, we look at sort of elevationally, and then 880 Lakeshore Drive, kind of diagonally behind it and rotated 90 degrees. So the system here is fairly easy. They're referred to as the glass house apartments, 26 floors, about 250 feet. And obviously the characteristic now is modern international style, high-tech architecture. Mies was um, famous for his work at the Bauhaus and then some of his earlier work for the government, for instance, the Barcelona Pavilion we, we drew earlier. And now in Chicago, when he emigrated to the United States, he landed at the Armour Institute in Chicago, which eventually becomes IIT, the Illinois Institute of Technology. Now these towers, you can imagine, weren't really admired too much when they were built, yet they went on to become the prototype for steel and glass skyscrapers worldwide. So at 26 floors, doesn't sound like much now, most people drive by them and they seem like they're just part of the puzzle of Chicago, but they were spectacular, spectacularly innovated with these grids of steel and glass curtain walls and a complete lack of ornamentation. So it should be a fairly easy sketch because we're not doing too much profile. We're just doing the two boxes in perspective with some of the neighborhood buildings around them in this characteristic international style. When we sort of um, detail it out, the only detail we really have would be how the users, the actual people, the tenants of the building, uh, accepted the neutral gray curtains that were um, detailed for all the apartments. I believe the 860 tower were three bedroom apartments and originally the 880 were one bedroom apartments. So they all had to work with the exact type of gray curtain. No other curtains or blinds were fitted because we just wanted to control the exterior environment. So they could come up and be opened up only proportions of the way. So either had to be fully closed, fully open, or sectionally at, at certain marks so that it looked like an orchestrated grid pattern. And it follows the minimalist composition and his epic saying that less is more, the skin and bones of architecture. So we have um, the closer building to us will be 860 Lakeshore Drive. We're really sure they're both known as that, even though this is 880 over here. And what we're going to do first off is simply do a nice uh, shadow wash. It's kind of a dark black steel base. And we're going to see such, such a little composition of this side as it goes back in perspective here. But we're simply going to draw that as a tone right now, straight up and down. And we'll detail some highlights in it later. Whereas in the front, we're going to leave white. And we'll detail most of it in terms of line work when we're done with the sketch. Then we we'll use the same type of dark tone over here to show the perspective of it, and then some different tones for the rest of the city around it. So probably with your mid-size flat brush, we can go into a pool of color that will be a mixture of blacks and grays like we've done for shadows before, and make it fairly full of water this time to start with as we build up our value from 20% to 90%. So that kind of steely dark blue. We'll make it fairly transparent so we get little bits of light as we kind of detail this out towards the end of the sketch this morning. Make sure there's enough water in there. And then we'll test the color over here again. 
maybe a little bit more black or Payne's gray or something deep and rich, kind of muddy up the blue. Okay. So we're good to start. So we're simply going to come to one side of it. Maybe add a little bit more water to it. And we're going to simply, from top to bottom, draw that down. So it's a nice, simple wash, running from top to bottom here. Then edge your brush on the line you drafted in. And again, the impurity of the water will allow for different patterns of light and texture in the glass as we build out the definition of how the sun hits it differently, the canyon of, of the streets kind of created a different effect. And now we have to step down to the thinner brush to get the same type of wash in the smaller space between the two towers. So top to bottom there. Eventually, we come to the bottom, there will be a series of columns which support the structure to touch down, and there's a recess for the lobby and foyer and the elevator shafts coming down. But they're eclipsed at our base by some growth of some trees that Nice had specked out for the site. So we'll simply draw those in, almost rising up to the first level of, of apartments. And we'll come in with the green stock later on. So we'll hold that place. Then we'll come a little bit beyond the corner of the box here and use some of the green later. Then they're going to have the bottom of their foliage. And we'll put some singular struts down those later to have them attached to the plaza out front. That wraps around on the back side. There's also one on this side of the corner between that and the neighboring building. And that'll help edge the base here. And we'll probably use a little bit of the sky to edge the corners up here. Instead of having white against white, we'll put some tone in here and some tone on the sky so there's something to greet the building up at the top. Okay, while we're here, we'll probably modify the color later, but for now, the next deepest tones we see from the photograph here is the furthest building in the backdrop, and that's got a nice relationship because this 20 four-story paradigm of the modern movement becomes one of the largest buildings in the 70s in the world of John Hancock, which held its its uh, status until Sears was built in town and eclipsed that several years later. So we'll make this one a little bit deeper because that reads more further black in the distance. And now I'll come in, because it's so far away, we're, we're not going to articulate the fenestration there as much. So we'll leave it just as a tone now. If we put too much detail in the background, we have to put more detail in the foreground. And then when we get done, we'll come back in and signify that because one of the features of John Hancock that's sort of known worldwide are twin radio towers up top. And that was engineered by a man named Fazer Khan, who was challenged with the idea of creating towers that would be both commercial and residential. An initial scheme for the SOM design architects was to create, in a sense, a newer version of two of these, where one block would be the office and one block would be residential. Then they realized at the design meeting that that was a bad site condition for people in offices to look across and see people in residences. So almost in a, in a simplistic view, at a meeting, he then said, why don't we stack them and put the residential on top of the office tower beneath it and then structure it with 
the idea of it being a cantilevered bridge that would come out from the earth. So if you tipped it sideways, the biggest pressure in a building isn't really top to bottom, it's left to right. So in a sense, these then are put inside an X cross bridge, which then allows for the height of these to go further and further. So the race was on then to be the tallest buildings in the world. So that's two of them for us. Now we've got another backdrop over here, which kind of again focuses us back on the interior. We use that same wash. It's it's a simpler shape now, so we'll simply take the broader brush and do that very quickly over here. And that'll bracket the windows that are going to read lighter on this edge of the sketch. Get that right down to the horizon line there. And then we have some idea of how the light's working here. Uh, what'll happen is you pick up patterns of light from the south over here, which will come through canyons in the town and light up certain towers at certain levels. And then what 860 picks up on, since it's being shrouded by this tower to the left and not receiving light, it's reflecting lights from the canyon in the glass. And that's part of our uh, detailing we'll put in to enliven the space there. So right now, the, the baselines that you've drawn in to start the sketch on the watercolor paper, they're three large segments by five large segments wide, in this case, five by three deep. And we'll segment those into four panels each so there are 12 windows here, and there are 20 on this side. And we'll do that later on in the sketch once all the wash is dry. So now we can look at our green palette and put in the base of those trees we had talked about, just to sort of create our, our composition here. And they are ornamental decorative trees, so they're warm and they're close in the foreground. So they can use a little bit of blue-green, but then you can warm them up. with some light green olive. And then maybe use some of the, the original tone for the building in there too, so they sort of share the same qualities of light. We'll test that next to it. It seems a little bit too brilliant. I'll cut that a little bit again with the the blue black we had used. And again, to mute it, we can always mix a dab of red into the green, and that takes it down a notch towards the browns. There we go. Try that. And that seems a little bit more neutralized instead of the kind of grassy green I originally mixed in. So coming over to the front. This will just be our base selection of where we're going to put the, finish, the um, vegetation. And we'll come back in. We'll shape that later on. But that's our placeholder to know we've got to keep that at the base. There is no lawn or green space out front. It's just a concrete deck for it. It's fairly close to Lakeshore Drive as it wraps around this part of the city, makes its bend by Oak Street Beach, then continues up the lake towards the Chicago suburbs to the north. Okay, then we have um, sort of a, a white frame building with darker windows here. So it reads just like a gray tone next to this. So we need a lighter wash. So we're going to mix the black with some white to make it more of a warmer gray. And then we'll simply add a lot of water to it. So it's fairly transparent in our first wash. So that's probably wide enough we can use the middle flat brush. And since this is fairly dry at the edge now, we can take this one down to show it's on the shade side because the light is coming from the south past the morning hours and these buildings face east towards Lake Michigan.
There we go. And I'll back up a step and paint in this one secondary grove of trees that's on the back side of the tower too in a second once that dries. So now we get the sense of there being uh, a canyon going back this way. It's kind of oblique for us because we see more of the face of the building. We'll use the same tone. We'll warm it up a bit for a stone building across the street. And that has a nice story behind its use and purpose. So we're going to warm this gray we have with a little bit of browns, kind of get that stone quality. We'll test that over here. So it's it's a warmer tone than our skin for the steel-clad modernist building. This is something more from the 20s where the steel structures were clad in stone to become more of a historical style and give an ornament. So once that's removed, you just have it in sense the structure itself. So in this case, this building that's on the edge of our sketch over here is one of those older buildings from earlier on in the century. So we're gonna wash that with that kind of stone feel to it over here. And then that is sort of drift off the left part of the sketch. We're not gonna worry about detailing that too much. Just keep that kind of innocuous over here, but it is not page white. It's got a little soft tone to it to show a material change. And the same is true over here. This building is clad with a vertical stone, a little bit more of a, a deco interpretation of building tall buildings. And that runs off to kind of page white too. And again, they're not part of the subject, so we may or may not even put fenestration in these, but they're sort of very simple interpretations of stylistic endeavors because it's all steel structure for all these buildings, pre and post Mies van der Rohe. Mies van der is the one who frees it up. It's truth in the architecture aligns with the aesthetic principles of this international style we've talked about and particularly those taught at the Bauhaus. It may look like a curtain wall where the actual wall rises up and is the structure as well. But in fact, the windows in this particular case are attached. So it kind of looks like it's the most progressive, but doesn't really make that switch until a little bit later on. The buildings are about 46 feet apart. And the statical grid rests on a 21-foot grid, and they're uniform on both buildings. Okay, so our next step is to, once these have dried here, is to kind of come back in with some more shade and shadow to articulate what we've done, and then we'll work towards the detailing. So we're coming back to our pool over here of kind of blue-black. I'm gonna make sure there's plenty of water in this time. So now we're moving from the original sort of 20% of value Towards more of our shade value. So you'll see that next to our original, it's a bit darker, a little bit less color, because now what we're gonna do is we're gonna throw either shade on the buildings that's cast from other buildings, or the shadows are more prominent, or even the reflection of the dark parts of buildings. So uh, before that, the little story about the relationship between these and the pride that Mies van der Rohe took in them, you'd think if he was uh, so happy with it, he'd actually move into the space itself. In fact, he bought a flat across the way in this building so he could look at his architecture. Because from obviously inside, you actually can't see the architecture, you see the lake, and that's the whole point of it, where nature is sort of your ornament. In this case, he wanted to be able to look at his pristine, uh, kind of crystalline vertical castles here. So what we're going to do is basically take the line of some of these in terms of their value, and we're going to show some of the reflected quality of changing things happening on this corridor that this building picks up, which kind of makes some of its ornament. When you look up at glass, you don't see the interior unless it's in the evening, but you do see the play of light off that glass. So we're simply going to stagger it by saying across the way down here, it's picking up some towers out of stepping thing, and it comes down to about this level, and it sees the darkness of its adjacent building across the height. 
So showing that with the small round brush, it would look something like this. And up high on the left here in the back, it's darkest and it kind of works its way down, kind of orthographic. So you follow the lines of the windows and as it steps, that looks like a tower is reflected off of that part. And then it steps and finds another tower that's lower adjacent to it. And then steps one more time. By the time we get to about this point, it's actually reflecting a dark neighbor directly across the street, which then we push across to our white edge over here, which gives more definition to its form. And now we'll end that right there because we're going to retreat a little bit of the sense of the courtyard down here beneath it. Not really a courtyard, but you can actually access an outdoor space beyond the columns that rise up here before you get to the core itself of the lobby and things. So that's one way to kind of articulate that. And the same is happening on the backside of this building where it's going to have a crisper edge on this edge right when it comes where it meets the rest of the space. So we want to move that from the top on down and it maybe comes lighter towards the base here. Just sort of animate those towers. We'll take the top of its neighbor to the west and make it stronger where it meets the sky and then bleed it back to just the water itself and drop that down so it's stronger here. And then right at the top again too, this is more of a brighter skin white frame, but even when it comes and touches the sky, it's darker in appearance right at the top. And that will also drop down to white. So fade that tone. So it's not so much what you know about the material, it's really how the play of light on the material and how it is perceived next to an adjacent tone. Now coming down to the base here, this building also will then start to reflect on the same perspective line because their windows are gonna match up with 860s. So there's a reflective thing on its skin, which gets picked up from a building across the street. So those windows will vanish eventually there. We'll do the same over on this side adjacent to our 880. And make that stronger edge at the top towards the sky. down. Again, it's an, a non-subject for us. It's just a neighbor. So we want that to have neutrality. Now we'll come back in with the green again. I'm going to do the second layer here. This one could probably even go a little bit further around that corner. And then the backdrop here. And I'll use the second tone of the green to go at the base to show that the light is being trapped. So that the trees are actually casting shadows on themselves. And then it's probably a good time to use one of our washes that's a little bit washed out with a bit more water in the shadow area and come down and do the ground plane. So we'll assume that the street level is brighter than the sidewalk level. So we leave that little bit of white in there for sidewalk and show more of a asphalt or a dirtier concrete skin for the roadways here. So that corner right here at the base is really important. Kind of move out to that a little bit with the lens. There you go. And that'll help sit it down by having that diagonal, which is vanishing back to the right horizon line.
So there's our, our place for the city now. Now that idea is to keep, go back in and keep doing more in the sketch as time allows. And so the first thing we're going to do is start to articulate what our potential is for the vertical bands here, because that's actually the ornament. It's the play of these gray louvered curtains, which are going to move up and down sequentially at only certain points. You can't put them up at seven and eighth inch. It has to be exact to whatever the increments are to raise or close them. And so it makes a sort of a mechanistic kind of decoration to show the activity of the people there. So we simply need to take what we've drawn in so far and bisect it twice and probably do this in pencil here. So there's the first tri trio, the middle third, and the end third piece. And now we do bisect it one more time, and then we'll have the right number of windows per apartment. So four per apartment. And again, since it's just kind of a quick sketch, you know, it doesn't have to be too precise, but I think you'll find that you can get fairly accurate just doing it freehand here. And it's not really it's more important to make sure you split the grid in half where, instead of worrying about trying to vanish to a point well up here. Because obviously these vertical lines eventually are going to meet, but it'd probably be maybe 10 feet off the paper up there. So we're far enough away where that isn't too dominant. And now we'll do the other side over here. Even though it's rotated 90 degrees, it still is the same profile of four windows per, per horizontal area. We bisect it once, and then we come back and do it one more time on the way back. One, two, So, so now we've got a, a grid of four, 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 four across. So five bays there, which is actually this side rotated. So now we just quietly for five minutes then kind of look between the photograph. We're going to do sort of interpretation of this. It doesn't have to be the identical thing because obviously it's switching through the course of the day. You want to work from the same type of deep blue over here for the shadow and then make sure... The fine point small brush isn't too thick with water and just dab back in little bits at a time and you can change the value per window so we'll simply look if somebody is in the space it would fill the value up and if they're out of the space or the blinds are down it ends up being white so it really ends up being sort of a, a change, an array of how the people perform in the space. So we're just going to fill up those boxes. More importantly, to show this middle section with a lot of activity. It could be between apartments or between rooms. This might be a bedroom area. So it's not exactly the same across the whole unit. Just make sure you bring those corners down so they have kind of a rectilinear approach. Another way to do this would be to replace your middle one with a flat that's about the size of your round. And that way you could have a little square edge on that. So if I shift to a brush like this, you see it's thin on one side and doing the other. Then when you paint it in, it's got a little bit of edge to you already. And we simply work our way down for a little bit. A 
more often than not, you'll do them probably in groups of four or three that show the rooms used consecutively the same way. So if they raise them or open them, they'd open them all across the length of the room. And typically on this side, they're more open than that because this is the spectacular view to the east and they look at that great body of fresh water. Probably more important to finish the top like that since it's going against a brighter sky behind it. Some value to it. And whereas in a lot of other drawings you've done together, the transparency of this would be very difficult because the room would return with a line of the height of the scene on the inside, but we're so far away now, that's a very difficult detail. And then when we turn the corner, we would have a little bit of sense of uh, the change in the pattern of it. The windows are closer to us, but the line work would be very subtle bringing that down because you have to get four panels within this one bay over here. So maybe just toward the edge, we can double that up to show that that pattern continues over here, but we're not going to show a lot of it. And up here, we just leave it kind of go to the sky as it reflects just the lights up above. Uh, and so we're going to spend a little bit of time now detailing the base here, because as you can see, there are the steel members that come down and then that center bay that's the actual lobby and access to the building tower. So in a sense, it's in kind of a bit of an exterior room. So that's easy to find because you simply take the underside of the box and vanish it back. So now we see the underside, so dropping down the four columns, excuse me, five columns on this side, one, two, three, four, and five. We can then draw the underside as being darker. So paint in a little area of our deeper value under the tower here. I'll show it going back and then give some presence to those shafts of steel coming down to open up that space. And the same thing happens on this side. We return the corner of the box back to the left vanishing point. That'll go a bit behind the trees. So we really only see a bit of each column up front and at the corner. And those will make it a little bit darker because they also anchor the space with their value. So first the underside. And then the columns.
And then because the light won't receive the shaft coming down, it ends up being just a darker blue box on the inside skin here. And we'll see. And so that's sort of the feet of our building. This one's kind of eclipsed by the tree line of the, of the front building here that makes a little bit of a courtyard in front of 880. And now uh, in a quicker match, because we're not really going between mullions over here, we'll just see in the distance a bit more of the planes over here working in concert. So the further we get away, the, the quicker the detailing becomes. We do some pairs, but mostly just sheets of tone on this one. So you get the rhythm of that to kind of pull out some of the detail in there, which is really just the structure itself. Another sort of e quote from Nice is he referred to the idea in construction is that God is in the details. So the details themselves of how the building was built becomes the sense of the ornamentation. And now we'll come back in as we kind of push, we're probably at that 40 or 50% value now. We're going to push towards 70 by taking our shadowing zone here and make sure we have enough of it, the blue black. Base in there. Check it out next to our original one. Okay, it's set to go. And once again, we'll start at the corners. The top here, the top of Hancock. I'm sure that punctures the sky up here. We'll come and put in the two towers towards the end of the sketch. And we'll drop that down. Let it be lighter as it addresses the canyon down below. Same is true for the neighboring building, a little bit crisper at the top here. Drop it down. Between the buildings. And then wash that down the spine so it gets lighter. And then the neighbor to the north, right where it comes to the edge of our subject matter. It starts, again, our goal on every sketch is to make sure our whites become whiter than the paper we started with. And that's just an illusion, but that's part of the skill set to draw out the volume. Now we use that to go underside our tree line. And if we're getting a bit more of the paint stock rather than just straight water wash, sort of a drier wash to get to a point where we can kind of delineate, we'll drop the base of the trees, kind of an elegant little thrust to vertical, which will land them in the plaza out front. And I'll set those trees down because 
they're floating up above, but they're also masses that are casting shadows down below. If the light basically comes from to the left of us here, then the base beneath those on the ground will draw a little sense of a zone which is deeper than the road itself that should set those trees down more and create a space down here. So we kind of environment of almost a three-dimensional volume before you get to the building itself and its entry. And now come in on the underside and make it a little bit stronger. That little sliver of underside of the threshold where you kind of enter the building proper. And that kind of holds and anchors that whole aspect down there. So that 70s then kind of gets us to our final point of going the deepest, and that's going to some of the panels that are closest to us, probably this corner section here, because once you see some of the information, it'll just sort of repeat itself in the perceiver's eye here, that we can go darker in some of the rooms. And again, in our, as we wrap around the corner here, it's kind of important to then show a little bit of sensitivity of the apartment windows within our dark. So there's always darks and definition in places that are grayed out or part of our tone system. It gives some kind of texture to that. Maybe a little bit up here in the bright part of it. And we'll do a couple of ticks over in the 860 as well. So at the top of Hancock, a little more iconic to show those towers here. One sits right about the middle of this when the tower is wide enough that we won't see the second tower, but it rises up in two sections. We'll make it a little bit broader than real life. And the top of that antenna goes outside of our vision off the paper. So that just means a little bit of a hint. It's white, but it needs to hold up against the sky. So we'll give a little bit of a value there. sort of the shade side of it. And that gives you a hint of what part of this part of Chicago you are once you see the iconic Hancock down the road there. Coming to the base, because now we can cast some shadows across the street that are being thrown by the towers here. So now vanishing back to the left point, we show light gray, light gray, moving across here. And that's why this ends up being in shadow over here because of the buildings on the left, which we don't really see. And then right to the base of this tower, maybe over here. And since they are the, the actual closest windows to us, you could articulate those, we'll give them a little definition of depth that goes back in perspective per floor. Right a lot there. 
again, it's it's a cartoon gesture to show scale in the neighboring units there. And now we'll come in for one last little zone of dark and we should be about finished. And then we'll do a little bit of a sky treatment up top, just in a neutral gray blue to give some backdrop to pull them off the paper at the top as well. well I think we'll come with this dark here at the corner where the sharpest contrast between the whites facing east and the whites that are in shade over here. Come to the top and a little bit darker too with some tones. Just enhancing all of our edges, all the shoulders of the project need more definition. So for the sky, with a, a very light, light blue base, add a bit of white to it to make it a milkier blue. And enough water to make sure it moves quickly across that area. It's such a small space, you better do a, a wet on wet wash, but just some milky cloudy gray and we'll leave some white between those. So probably with the small enough here even to use the round brush. We'll just move that adjacent to our structure here. Right through Hancock's power, invisible crevice. And then continue over here and push that tone right to the edge of the white skin. And we'll probably keep it just on top of the two eight sixty eight. 880 and let it sort of dissipate off to the right white paper on the sky. If you add a little bit more on top of the first wash, you can create some sort of horizontalities if it's moving back and going deeper behind the buildings. So once it sets up, I'll come back in to the original drafting unit I had to do baselines. Uh, that was probably a three point. I'm gonna use a five point just to come back in, not with the water wet now, that would make it splay. But when it's dry, you set up and just go to the edges and everything that creates space, just box that out. Maybe a little detail with line work or some of the closer windows to me, and then we should be done. These are the towers, basically something like this. Look in the bottom, 